All right, so this is uh, part two on resonance and uh, standing waves. And um, we've already seen how um, standing waves can be created in a spring or a string by essentially a series of traveling waves that um, interfere with each other and um, both constructively and destructively to create regions of uh, maximum amplitude known as antinodes and regions of no amplitude called nodes. nodes. So this brings us to uh, resonance which is a, a phenomenon that happens all over in nature. In particular things with musical instruments are a great example of that. And um, resonance is basically it's the tendency of objects to, to vibrate or oscillate with a maximum of amplitude. So it's the tendency of an object to oscillate at a maximum amplitude. And the thing is that this oscillation is only going to happen at very specific frequencies. So you could imagine, for example, plucking a guitar string or blowing air into a trumpet or a flute. Those um, instruments are going to resonate at a maximum amplitude. They're going to create a nice big sound at a really specific frequency when you, when you do that. Um, another example of resonance would be if you picture a child on a swing. So you imagine, I'm just going to use this pendulum from FET here to kind of demonstrate that. Imagine that if I have a child on a swing, if I pull them to the side and I let them go, they're just naturally going to swing back and forth at, um, at their natural resonance frequency. And you can imagine that if I was here and if I wanted this student to swing higher and higher, I could push that student. But if I wanted to push them in a way where they went higher and higher, I'd have to make sure I pushed with a really specific frequency. So I could push each time they come back, so now, and then now, and so on. And if I repeated that frequency, then the student would end up swinging sort of higher and higher, and they'd get a larger and larger um, amplitude as a result. So this, um, <clears throat> this can be used to model what happens in so-called resonance tubes. And so resonance tubes are things like, for example, um, in class when we had the uh, graduated cylinders and we blow air across the top of them and they vibrate and they make a loud noise. Um, at, um, uh, and that, that noise, that frequency of that noise tends to vary with the length of the tube. And we can model that um, by looking at this idea of resonance and standing waves. So um, imagine a situation where I've got a, a, um, a fixed, fixed resonance tube or a situation where both ends of my tube are closed. In that case, each end will be a node. Now, this might seem like kind of a, a silly example, but let's take a, take a look here. So here's a picture of a, a fixed, <clears throat> fixed, fixed resonance tube. And while I can't think of a musical instrument that has a a tube that's closed on both ends, um, you could actually just draw an analogy to say a guitar string. So this is a lot like a guitar string where one end is fixed at one end of the neck and the other end is fixed to the body. And when you pluck the string, the string is going to tend to vibrate back and forth at its natural resonance frequency. As it turns out though, that's not the only frequency that string will vibrate at. Um, we talked about harmonics in class and how if you wanted to, you could get this to vibrate at a higher frequency like for example this one right here. You could get this to vibrate back and forth at a higher, still a natural frequency, but a, a higher frequency. And so on and so on. And so there are really specific uh, standing waves that we can set up on this guitar string. If I go down to my fundamental here, or the first harmonic, you can see that this represents exactly half a wave. And then the, the first overtone or the second harmonic, you can see that this represents one full wave. But there would be no way for me to fit on here like exactly one-third of a wave or two-fifths of a wave. That wouldn't fit in this space. I can have half a wave, I can have two waves, one and a half waves, and so on. And So we're going to just learn how it is, what are the rules there that dictate what kinds of waves you can fit into, um, into these resonance tubes. So let's take a look at um, this first example. Like I said, the first example is one where we've kind of got a node at each end, and so the waveform is going to look something kind of like this. And we can see that I'm fitting half a wave in there. Um, let's just refer to this distance here as L or length. And the length for each of these tubes will be the same. So this is the, this is the first harmonic. And the first harmonic gets a special name, which is the fundamental frequency. 
It's fundamental because it's the lowest possible frequency that I can use and still um, create a standing wave. <clears throat> So if you take a look at this picture here, you can see that we fit exactly one half of a wavelength into L. And so by that logic, our wavelength would be equal to two times the length of the tube. If we compare that to, let's say, the second <clears throat> harmonic. Well, in the second harmonic, you can see we've got a node at this end, a node at this end, but we added a node right in the middle. And so we get this sort of pattern here. And in this case, we can see that the length, L, it fits perfectly one wavelength. Let's go up to the third. The third harmonic. Again, what we're doing, we've got a node at each end. But in this case, now I have two more nodes in the middle. And so my pattern is going to look something like this. And you can see that in this length, we are fitting three halves of a wave into the length, which means the wavelength is equal to 2L over 3. Now, this carries on and on as you go, the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and so on, um, harmonic. As you go higher and higher, they're sort of less likely to appear in a, in a string or in a resonance tube, but they do exist. And so you can see, if you look across here at our relationship, uh, the fundamental was our wavelength equal to 2L, and then the next um, level up, our wavelength is equal to the L, and as we go up, then it was 2L over 3. Now, if you think about what is the general pattern for just the nth harmonic, you can see here that the pattern seems to be that if I take 2 times L and divide it by N, that is going to equal my wavelength. Okay, so in any fixed fixed um, scenario, I'm going to have 2L over N uh, gives me my wavelength. Now something to consider here um, when we're talking about resonance tubes compared to like say strings on a, uh, on a guitar or on a violin or something like that. When I look at this picture here, something I want to draw your attention to is you can talk about the displacement of the particles or the displacement of the string. So, for example, in this tube, you can see in the middle, these particles are moving a lot. And by the edges, these particles on either side are moving not at all. Same thing with the string. The string in the middle moves back and forth a lot, whereas on the sides, on the ends here where the nodes are, the strings don't move at all. I want to compare that to this graph here, which is showing the average pressure difference in these two areas. Notice how where the particles are moving the most, the pressure is actually the least. Whereas when we look at either end, the particles on either end, the little um, air molecules that are moving back and forth, at the end, they experience the greatest pressure. You can see here it's being compressed the most and then expanded the most. And I should say it has the greatest diversion from pressure. So when all the particles squish over to this side, it's a really large amount of pressure. And then when all the particles squish back the other way, it drops down and we have a really low pressure. So just to note that when we have sound waves, a displacement node will be a pressure anti-node and vice versa. So maybe let's we'll do a quick plot of that. If I plot, for example, my displacement versus time, I might see a variation that looks like this. And then if I pl plot a pressure difference, a differential versus time, I would see something that looks like this. Where um, I've got nodes at either end and in this case, I have a node in the center. And in this case here, I have an antinode in the middle, whereas on this side here, I have antinodes at either end. Okay, so we're just gonna keep on uh, moving here, and we're gonna compare two other um, types of resonance tubes. Um, the next one that we're gonna look at here is going to be a fixed free resonance, where one end of the tube will be a uh, node, but the other end will be an antinode. Now this is very similar to what we did in class with the, um, with the uh, graduated cylinders. If I open up one side here, 
and take a look at what's going on. You can see at this far end of the tube, the air molecules are able to move quite a bit. They can move back and forth lots, frankly. Whereas at this end of the tube, the closed end, they actually can't move uh, very much at all. And so what I get here is I get an antinode, uh, sorry, a node at this end, whereas I get an antinode at the far end. And that's gonna change the sort of the geometry of these, of these waves and the, what kinds of waves we set up. So the first harmonic, would again have a node here, but an antinode at our far end. And again, we'll talk about the length of the tube here being L. Okay, so we take a look at this picture here. This is a little bit different because I don't actually fit a wavelength in here. In fact, I don't even fit a half a wavelength. All I can fit in this tube now is one quarter of a wavelength which is equal to L. And so just doing some quick algebra there, you can see the wavelength is gonna equal four times L. Now, the funny thing is here, there is no second harmonic. If I try and set up a second harmonic, I'm not gonna have a situation where I can have a node and an antinode at either end. If I double the frequency of this quarter wave and try and fit a half wave in here, I'm gonna run into a situation where I have a node and a node on either end. So the second harmonic doesn't exist, I'm gonna skip straight to the third harmonic. And the third harmonic, again, happens when I've got a node here, and I'm going to add another node along the way. So my wave's going to go up, back down, and then end in an antinode. Down, up, and antinode. And we can see here, along this uh, line here, I'm fitting three quarters of a complete wave, and that equals L. And so I guess if I wanted to find my wavelength, that would equal 4L over 3. Again, I can jump to my fifth um, fifth harmonic, and so I'm going to add another node. So I've got a, um, a node at one end. I'm adding an additional node here and here, and so I'll go up, down, up, and at the end, down, up, down, and I get to the end of the tube. And in this case, you can see that I'm actually fitting five quarters of a wavelength into L, and so my wavelength equals four-fifths of L. And so we can see a similar pattern emerge here. Um, for the nth harmonic of a fixed free system, we could say that the nth wavelength is going to be equal to 4L divided by N. Remembering, of course, that we skip our even, uh, even number harmonics. They don't exist. Okay, last but not least here, we're gonna look at a free-free system. Now in a free-free system, we'll just take a quick look here. Looks like this, if both sides of the tube are open. So you can imagine this being like, for example, a flute, where you blow into one end of the flute, but the other end is open as well. Um, and you can see here that on either end, I get an antinode. I got an antinode on the far end, antinode on the other end, and right in the center then is where I get a node. And so, what's this gonna look like? Well, my first harmonic, or my fundamental frequency in a tube of length L is going to have an antinode at one end, a node in the center, antinode at the other end. And so it will look something like this. Okay. Now, if you look closely at this, maybe it's not uh, obvious straight away, but if you look close, you'll notice that you can actually fit, this is fitting exactly half a wave again. So one half of a wavelength fits into L, which means my wavelength is equal to 2L. When I jump to my second harmonic, I'm going to add a second node, and I should get this pattern. And you can see, if you look closely there, that that is fitting exactly one wavelength into L. Our third harmonic, carrying this pattern along, we're going to add another node. And so it's going to go down and up and down, up and down and up. And so if you look closely here, you can see that we're fitting three halves of a wavelength into L. And so the wavelength would equal two thirds of L. And so if we generalize this moving forward and we talk about our nth wavelength, we can see that wavelength n is just going to have a length of 2L divided by n, where again in this case we can have the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, harmonic, and so on. All right, that's it for part two.